one. Mesa Verde, as it appeared at the fir to the first white explorers venturing across the southwestern tip of Colorado, the boyhood of Richard Wetherill, first settlers in the Green Valley, the Wetherills' homestead, their Alamo ranch at Mancos, and learn about hostilities with the Utes. Chapter 1 Its sheer sides of yellow stone rising to green-capped summit, pierced on eastern approaches by a labyrinth of canyons, the mesa forms a vast valley bastion in southwestern Colorado. A man could wander over it lost for months, traverse its canyon depths, and never once cross his own trail. Hard to the east loom the saw-toothed high La Platas, the eye sweeping westward across the sloping land broken only by a few small streams, is unhindered for sixty miles until the flat blue eminence of Sierra Abajo. What brought men here and where they came from is from no one is sure, but a prehistoric people once lived among the clouds on the mesa top. After centuries there, they moved into cliff villages that were the works of stonemason's art. The villages they built in caves and cavities of the porous rock, their fragile walls, windowed towers, and tiers of rooms and terraces were suspended dizzying heights above the canyon bottoms. Then, faced by a disastrous calamity of nature, or perhaps by a hostile enemy, they moved away. The mesa was abandoned into silence and slow time change of the seasons. In winter, it was dark-visaged, menacing. Snow collared its base in deep drifts and streaked its rocky face on projecting ridges. In summer, the hot sun turned the fingering canyons and heights above green again. Clouds moving before winds overhead cast giant shadows that drifted west to east across the valley, darkening the verdant mesa top. Pinion pitch was in the air. The bright flash of Bluebird's wing glinted before an empty cave mouth. Bands of semi-nomadic Utes, dwelling in buffalo-skin teepees and shunning the stone cliff houses, were the next people known to inhabit the region. Although they hunted game on the mesa summit and also prowled the difficult canyons, they preferred to live in the low valleys and make their camps close to river streams. Awed by the majestic mesa, the Utes storied it with supernatural importance. They ringed it with superstition and myth old by the time the first Spaniards penetrated the country. In the last quarter of the 19th century, the first Americans came by wagon into the valley, settled in uneasy contact with the Utes, and listened to the Indian myths of Mesa Verde. Among the first of these settlers was a family named Wetherill. The first Wetherills to cross the Atlantic came with other religious refugees from England in the early days of the colonies, breaking through forest and establishing farms along the eastern seaboard. They were of several faiths, but most of those who settled in the good farm country of Pennsylvania were Quakers, living hard, simple lives in the conservative pattern of their religious teaching. One of this clan, born Benjamin Kite Wetherill, was born on Christmas Day, 1831, in Chester County, Pennsylvania. He was a restless fellow who wanted to see the new country far beyond the western hills. At the age of 21, he left his father's farm for Wisconsin, moving shortly after to Iowa. On May 22, 1856, he and Marion Tompkins, also a Quaker, were married in the Friends Meeting House in Iowa Falls. Benjamin took his wife back to Chester, and there on June 12, 1858, their eldest son, Richard, was born. Other children followed, a daughter, Anna, then four more sons, Benjamin Alfred, John, Clayton, and Winslow. A second daughter, Alice, died as a young girl. None of the children was to have any remembrance of the East, for their father refused to stay long in Pennsylvania. When Richard was a year old, his parents moved to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. From this point, Benjamin, short, wiry, and always restless, set out on long adventures. During President Grant's administration, he was appointed an Indian trail agent, which required his absence from home for unpredictable lengths of time. 
riding the Chisholm Trail into Oklahoma Territory in Texas, adjusting land and stock disputes which cattle drives stirred up between Indians and whites, he became known in the prairie towns as an able mediator, a man who could, if not fearlessly, then thoughtfully placate the angriest nest of hostile Indians. He may have boasted about this in the places where he stopped, or his ruggedly independent devil take the attitude with idlers and meddlers may have irked many who were acquainted with him. In any case, he also was regarded as sometimes irascible, usually stiff. With his own family, he was a loving husband, if a bit formal, and a good father who taught the boys everything he knew and encouraged them to strike out for themselves. The family did not attend church regularly, but with Bible readings and lessons at home, the children were reared strictly in the Quaker faith. Marion Wetherill took the fullest share of this responsibility, and to her, probably more than to their father, the boys owed the warp and weft of Quaker principles, which so strongly patterned their lives. Marion was a little woman, quiet, self-effacing, yet she ruled her household with growing boys firmly. Her tastes and background were simple enough, coming as she did from a farm family, and she was a good homemaker. Sturdy and plump, with sharp blue eyes, she was the rallying point for her family during her husband's long absences. Growing up in Fort Leavenworth, always looking forward to their father's new stories of adventure, Richard acquired much of the tough fiber of Benjamin's character and a little of his autocratic disposition. With it, he had some of the leavening gentleness of his mother's calm. Even as a youth, there was assurance in his dark gaze and in his quiet way of speaking. He had a sense of humor and liked fun, but even as a boy, he did not encourage anyone to play a joke on him. When he was eighteen, broad-shouldered but not tall, four inches under six feet, his dark brown hair began to turn gray. He spoke in unhurried sentences, his tone quiet, but a bit high in register, and he kept his eyes fixed, unbleaking and often quizzical, upon those he was addressing. Some of his friends have said that they had a nervous feeling that he gazed right into their minds. In a rugged way, he was good-looking. He had a sudden, dazzling smile that flashed across a usually serious face and sometimes a way of holding his head that some thought cocky, chin up and tilted. Equally characteristic was his erect posture. Richard had a straight back. Even as a boy, he had big wrists and big capable hands. His only formal education he received in the schools at Fort Leavenworth. He learned to speak German with some fluency and retained it always, but later shunned the thundering Germanic epithets for the delicate-sounding expletives of the Navajo tongue. Anglo-Saxon curses he used not at all. His instructors in Kansas gave Richard a good grounding in mathematics, history, and geography. Although he liked books and read a great deal, he never acquired any skill in English composition or taste for it. His handwriting had bold, handsome line, but his grammar was faltering and awkward on paper. He spelled fairly well, but punctuation bored him. Usually he dispensed with it, relying upon hit-or-miss peppering of dashes. It was this period at Leavenworth, 1859 to 1876, that shaped his character. His mother worried constantly over her large family, wondering how she would keep her children clothed and fed on her husband's small earnings. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm